their continuing journey in the wilderness. So the first, I think the first eight or nine chapters of, of Numbers are all about sensing the people, counting them. How many people were in each of the tribes when Moses counted them? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. This is Jesus' favorite book. Why do I say that? Those of you who have been here. He always quoted Deuteronomy. He quoted more from the book of Deuteronomy than he did any other book in the Old Testament. When he was confronted by the devil, everything that he quoted to the devil was from the book of Deuteronomy. The word itself means second law. Deutero in, in Greek means two. Nominus means law. So the word means second law. It's a repetition of the law. So you find the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, you'll find the Ten Commandments in the book of Deuteronomy. It's a repetition of the law. Okay? That's what the word means. Okay? These were written by Moses. Moses. Okay. Moses. Yes. All right, you ready? The rest, will, I hopefully, will go a little bit quicker, because we have a lot of books. How many books in the Old Testament? 42. 46. Very good, head of the class. Someone's going to heaven. All right? What comes after the story of Moses? Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra. Nehemiah, Tobit, we're going to stop right here. Joshua through Nehemiah describes the history of Israel after they went into the promised land, settled, created the monarchy under Saul, David, and Solomon, the divided monarchy, all the way until the time that they were sent into exile into Babylon. Then they came back from exile under Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, and reestablished the homeland. Okay? Now, it's important to know all of these books, with few exceptions, are all historical. These are all history. The problem is they're not in order. The problem is they're not in order. So if you pick up the Bible and say, well, I'm going to read the Bible for the first time, I'm going to pick up the Bible. And you start reading in Genesis, you're good. You get into Exodus, good. It's a little bit long and drawn out. And some of it's boring, you know, law, law, law. Golden calf every now and then, you know, and then more law, more punishment, and then on and where we go? Then you hit the book of Leviticus, and then you say, forget this Bible reading. This is nuts. <laughs> Okay, because Leviticus isn't a narrative, it's law. Okay, it's the priestly book. It's a handbook for the Jewish priests. So it's not meant for, it, it doesn't tell a story. It's just, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat this, don't wear that. Be sure to wash before this holy day. Kill the lamb in this way. I don't care about that, all right? Numbers picks up the story, Deuteronomy, you're repeating yourself in Exodus. Then you're back to the story again. Joshua, Judges, Ruth is out of order. Ruth should be where, um, halfway in between Judges. It should be put into Judges. It's a part of that story, but it's not after it. So this is the problem with trying to read the Bible chronologically. It's not written chronologically, or I should say it's not put together chronologically. And that's why people get stumped with it and they say, I can't understand it. Well, what you can't understand is that it's not meant to be written this way. It's not meant to be read this way. That's why I'm going to give you my Reader's Digest version. Okay? So you stick with the narrative and you avoid all of the other stuff that is just not, not relevant for right now until you get the bigger picture. You following me? For example, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings are repeated in 1st and 2nd Chronicles. It's the same story over again. You go, well, why are you repeating yourself? Ah, there's a reason why. Okay? 
Um, the short answer is this. Samuel and Kings are human perspective. Chronicles is God's perspective of the same incident. Mm. Hmm. What incident? The, the, um, the development of the monarchy beginning with Saul through the exile. So Samuel and Kings all describe all of the kings of Israel from Saul, David, Solomon onward until they went into exile. Chronicles does the same thing. The difference is Chronicles tells it from God's point of view, Samuel and Kings from earthly perspective. That's, what, that's kind of the subtlety that you need to know about reading the Bible. Okay. Ezra and Nehemiah are just returned from exile. Now you hit the book of Tobit. Tobit is part of the um, pre-exile of the ten tribes of Israel. So it's a historical book, but again, it's out of order. This should be roughly halfway in between First and Second Kings, as far as a chronology goes. Okay? That's when it happens, if you want to look at a chronology. That's why you need to get this. You need to get a sense of the timeline of when things happen. Because if you, you can't see it from back there, but at the very top, it tells you what books of the Bible are happening when. Okay? That's up here. What books of the Bible are happening when. So that way you don't get things all mixed up. Tobit, Judith, Esther, Job. Now again, Job happened during the time of Abraham. So it's again a story that's out of place in chronology. All right? That's the end of historical books. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Songs, Wisdom, Sirach, these are all called wisdom books. These are just, if you will, Hebrew philosophy. They're just wisdom. The Psalms are considered a wisdom book, but they're primarily songs. It's the hymn book of the Bible. The Psalms are the hymn book of the Bible. By the way, the Psalms are the largest book in the Bible. There are 150 chapters of Psalms. 150 chapters. Okay? 150 chapters. By chapters, we mean each song is a chapter. Yes. So there's 150 of them. Primarily ascribed to David. That's why they're called the Psalms of David. They are so numerous that in every Mass, we virtually sing one of the Psalms in every Mass. There are certain times when we sing other parts, but we primarily sing a psalm all the time in Mass. Always. Always. There are psalms for every occasion. Every occasion. They are especially read during Passover. Okay? If you're a Jew, you will spend most of your time in Passover reading and singing the psalms. If I'm not mistaken, it's Psalms 117 to 122. You sing those psalms during Passover because they are a joyful celebration of God's victory over his enemies, which is what the celebration of Passover is. 117 to... 117 to 122, if I'm not mistaken. Okay? That particular clump of psalms are psalms... They're called Hallel Psalms. Hallel in Hebrew means praise. Hallelujah. Yah is the first name or syllable of God's name. Praise to God. Hallelujah. That's what that word means. Hallel, it's a Hebrew word. Hallelujah. Okay. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Baruch, Ezekiel, Daniel, these are called the major prophets. Major prophets. As opposed to the colonel prophets. <laughs> Just a little Bible humor. 
They're called the major prophets because they are bigger in size than the minor prophets, of which there are 12. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Here's a good way to know if you're in the Old Testament. If the name sounds weird, you're in the Old Testament. <laughs> Ecclesiastes, Baruch, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. What the flip are these? If you're saying that, you're in the Old Testament. For example, the book of Obadiah is only one chapter long. The book of Jonah is only three chapters long. The book of Isaiah is 60 chapters long. That's why he's a major prophet and the others are minor. It has to do with the length of their books, which is interesting because Daniel in Hebrew is 12 chapters long and the book of Zechariah is 14 <laughs> chapters long. So why is he relegated to minor prophet status? Um, because, um, just because. <laughs> so roughly what you have here is a division of the books you have historical books books about history you have books of wisdom philosophy how to live life and you have prophetic books those are the three rough divisions in the Old Testament historical books <coughs> prophetic books and wisdom literature. Were they written by the, those people? Yes. So they were attributed to Isaiah, Jeremiah, etc. Now whether Isaiah himself personally penned it or had secretaries like Jeremiah, when you read the book of Jeremiah you find out that it was Baruch who wrote everything that Jeremiah said. But he wrote everything that Jeremiah the said. Of them are yes, written. yes, yes. And Chronicles and Kings. Yeah. Who wrote that? Ah, good question. Some of the historical books we are not certain as to who wrote them. The best of scholarship will tell you that most likely Ezra and Nehemiah redacted them. Chris. That is the Jewish Torah. The Jewish Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is the Torah. When you hear Jews talk about the Torah, they're talking about those five books. I spy a question brewing. Yes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Baruch, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Those are your major prophets. Yes. Technically, Jeremiah is considered, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and Baruch were once considered one book. It was later divided into three separate books because they're all from the same prophet. Okay? Now, you're probably wondering why some of these books are in red. <coughs> There's one other set of books, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. The reason is, the books in red are not found in Protestant versions of the Bible. You will not, if you buy a King James Bible, you will not see these books in there. You look in vain for them. These are only in Catholic Bibles. Why? Because Martin Luther, back in the 16th century, decided to get a purified version of the Bible. And in his view, the Old Testament was only pure if it was written in Hebrew. The books of Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, parts of Esther and Daniel were written in Greek. 
And so he said, um, these can't be authentic books of the Old Testament because they were written in Greek, not Hebrew. So he cut them out. Give me the scissors. Out. That's the propaganda story for it. The real reason is, is that the, the teachings in these books contradicted, contradicted reformational teachings. For example, in the books of 2 Maccabees, it describes praying for the dead, that their souls may be released from their sins. What does that sound like to you? Purgatory. Purgatory. Martin Luther didn't believe in purgatory. So we just cut that right out of the Bible. Thank what, you very much. Why didn't someone contest uh, Luther? Because he was right. And he was the one that was standing up against the church, the corrupt papist church, our hero. So he <laughs> couldn't be wrong, right? Fortunately, he didn't change anything out of the New Testament, so both Protestants and Catholics have the same New Testament. Although Martin Luther had his doubts about the book of James and the book of Revelation. Why the book of James? Because the book of James says you are justified by works and not by faith alone, which was completely opposite to what the reformers were teaching. The book of Revelation he didn't like because in the book of Revelation, Jews got saved. <laughs> Here's a big shocker for you. All of the reformers, Martin Luther, Zwingli, John Calvin, John Knox, were very anti-Semitic, extremely anti-Semitic. Any book that saw that the Jews could be saved was considered suspicious. So John Calvin refused to write a commentary on the book of Revelation because of that reason. They just ignored them. They didn't have any good reason to get rid of them. They just simply ignored them. Little